Will you join me responsively in our call to worship this morning? God of mystery, you called Ananias by name and he responded. You called Paul to the work of your church and he responded by giving his life to your word. Similarly, you call us into community and faith. So we respond with love and time, energy and hope. We respond with worship. Let us worship the God of transformation and grace. Amen. Well, friends, we are continuing this week our series called Unraveled. We've been talking about where God is when the good things in our life start to unravel. But we've also been talking about where God needs to be in our life when there are things in our life that that need some unraveling. And today, I want to invite you to zoom out our lens a little further. We, we started talking about what personally in our own lives needs to unravel, and then we started talking about what in our community needs to unravel. This week, I want you to zoom out as far as you possibly can to a global view, a big perspective, and think about what needs to be unraveled, what needs to be undone, dismantled in our world. And then today, after the sermon, I'm going to invite those of you here in person to come write those on scraps of cloth here on this table. And those of you on Zoom, you can place that in the chat box. Let's bring all those prayers before God. What needs to unravel in our world right now? Well, we turn now to our scripture for this morning. It comes from Acts 9, but before we get to our focal passage, we're going to turn back a couple chapters to chapter 7 of the books of, book of Acts which is where we first meet the Apostle Paul, who at the time went by the name Saul. And you might recall that Acts is the story of how the first Jesus followers began meeting in community and eating and worshiping together and trying to do this Jesus way thing together. But as this community formed, Jesus' original disciples, they were having trouble meeting all the needs of all the people in the church and in the community, particularly the needs of the widows and the orphans. And so they chose a guy named Stephen to help them out, and the the movement starts to grow. But the Jesus movement was seen by many in their community as this sort of cult, this queer, fringe, non-orthodox faith movement. And there were many in their community who also knew that what the people in this movement were saying, things like that Jesus was the son of God, a title reserved only for the emperor, that it could get not only people in that movement, but everyone in their community in trouble. So just as they had with Jesus, they started plotting against them. And the first guy they arrest is Stephen. Arrest him on charges of trumped up blasphemy. And they decide that they're gonna stone him. Well, that's where we're going to pick up the story today. Enraged by his testimony, A mob has rushed Stephen. They've grabbed him and dragged him out of the city to be stoned. But of course, none of these elite men who are doing the stoning want to get their coats dirty. So they're taking them off before they start hurling stones, and they're laying their coats at the feet of someone who seems to be in charge of this whole persecution. And you know, this gentility in the midst of such violence, it's almost hard to stomach. Paul, Saul's story, it doesn't start out pretty, but I invite you to listen because we have to know where the story starts if we want to understand the complete 180 trajectory of where it goes. Then they dragged him, Stephen, out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died, and Saul approved of their killing him. That day, a severe persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and all, um, sorry, that day, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house and dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison. 
And now we're going to jump to today's passage, where we hear about Saul, Paul again in chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now he was going along and approaching Damascus, when suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, he asked who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they had heard the voice, but they saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for the man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias, who comes in and lays hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here, he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings, before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house, he laid hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. God of grace and love, we come to you this morning. We are longing, as always, to hear you speak a fresh word into our lives. And so we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing to you, and where, if anywhere, we depart from your spirit, O God. May that quickly fall away. Amen. Well, at the age of 96 this week, after ruling for over 70 years, Queen Elizabeth II died. And as echoes of God rest the queen, long live the king, echoed around the globe, it was complicated. Grief, admiration, and gratitude for her service could be heard all over the place. And you know, the extension of the public cries for grief into the far corners of the world, it really reminded, didn't it, just how far-reaching and global the British Empire had been at the start of her reign, and in its impact continues to be. Her era represents one-third of U.S. history, which is truly remarkable when you think about it. It's not been so long since we ourselves were tangled up with that empire and monarchy, right? But of course, as I said, it's complicated. Underneath the grief and the admiration and the gratitude, I started picking up whispers of other mixed emotions often from one and the same people who had expressed the former. They came largely from the margins, 
largely from people I know with black and brown skin. Queen Elizabeth II represented an empire that is directly responsible for the enslavement and human trafficking of many across the globe, a legacy from which we are still, to a large extent, recovering. And so for some, especially those who have been most deeply impacted by that legacy, there is pain, there is rage even, in seeing the monarchy and all that it represents persist into yet another generation. It's complicated. There is right now this global unraveling of all these mixed emotions as one era of the British monarchy closes and another begins. And of course, it's complicated all the more by the fact that a flawed, imperfect man with some deep harm-causing mistakes in his past is now the one to assume the throne with his former mistress. I've listened to the criticisms of Charles and Camilla with particularly pricked ears, and I, I couldn't figure out why for a little bit. And then I realized it's because the LGBT community, of which I'm a part, is also rampant with stories of those who marry someone out of pressure and duty, thinking that it's their role to play, trying to stuff down their real love, their real attractions, only to have it bubble and surface nevertheless. If he can't be redeemed, shown grace, and start again, I wonder, can any of us? Life sure gets tangled sometimes, doesn't it? Power and privilege, even duty and honor, they certainly can make a mess of things when they want to. Empires do harm, and who do you hold accountable? if not those with the power and authority within those empires, even if they are good, nice people like the queen. It's all enough to make you wonder, can it ever be unraveled in a way that really heals and repairs? And can imperfect, harm-doing characters in these global stories ever be redeemed, ever considered fit for leadership? You know, the ickiness people feel with Charles stepping into power, it pales in comparison, I imagine, to the ickiness and the revulsion that people felt watching Paul step into a, a position of power and authority within the early Jesus movement. He quite literally had blood on his hands. It's to his story that we turn our attention this morning, the story of someone who did a complete 180 with his life. I wonder if you've ever done that, been walking in one direction and completely done an about face. Maybe you went from hating Brussels sprouts to loving them. Maybe you went from swearing you'd never live in Florida to retiring here. Or maybe it's something more significant. Maybe you changed political parties or faiths. Maybe you went from hating a group of people to advocating for them. Or maybe you turned away from an addiction, started living life clean and sober. Conversions and transformations, they happen to us all the time. And sometimes they're big and dramatic, and sometimes they're small, almost imperceptible. But oftentimes they have a more global and far-reaching impact than we even realize. This week, the creators of our worship series, they directed me to two TED Talks. One was a talk by Christian Picciolini. You may not know, but he was once the leader of the first neo-Nazi skinhead gang in the United States. The second was the talk of Megan Phelps Roper, the granddaughter of Fred Phelps. She was raised as a member of the Westboro Baptist and began picketing LGBT funerals with her family, holding up message boards of hate before she could even read them. Both of their stories are stories of radical transformation and conversion. Both renounced and left movements that were doing violence and causing harm. And both embraced a new way, this way of love. 
And the question I brought with me into my listening of both of these TED Talks was twofold. First, what led to their initial radicalization and harm-causing cru crusades in the first place? And second, what sparked their conversion and ultimately facilitated their transformation? And surprisingly, I heard a lot of similar themes in both their stories. Now, one of them was radicalized as a teenager into his hate movement. The other was born into it. But both used similar language to describe what got them to stay and continue spreading hate, doing violence. There was one key theme. Anyone guess what it is? The key theme was belonging. Piccolini didn't join the white power movement because he'd always been filled with these racist, hateful views and he finally found a group that agreed with him. He joined because he didn't know who he was. He didn't know what he was supposed to do with his life and he didn't feel he belonged anywhere. This group made him feel like he belonged. As he put it, some of the strongest hatred in life starts with self-hatred. Likewise, Phelps Roper stayed in the Westboro Baptist Church even after becoming an adult and kept participating in their pickets because that was her community. That was her family. It was all she had ever known, and she had been led to believe it was a righteous cause. Listening to both of their stories got me wondering about the Apostle Paul. What radicalized him? As many of you probably know, Paul straddled two different worlds. He was Jewish and a Roman citizen. He spoke Greek and Hebrew. He was fully immersed in Jewish theology and Greek philosophy. And while this might make him seem quite privileged, I also wonder if it left him quite isolated. I wonder if neither group, the Jews or the Romans, truly considered him an insider. I wonder if each group distrusted him for his membership in the other. I wonder if he didn't know where he belonged or wasn't fully sure he was completely welcomed or wanted in either circle. I certainly can relate to that to some degree as a member of the LGBT community and also the Christian clergy. Sometimes it's hard to feel like you belong anywhere. I wonder as tension grew between the occupying Roman Empire and the occupied Jewish people, as more and more the purpose of the Jewish people became liberation and more and more the purpose of the Romans became their occupation and, uh, excuse me, their occupation and oppression, I wonder in the midst of all of that if Paul knew what his purpose was. Did his violent crusade against Jesus' followers emerge from that core need for belonging? For purpose? Did he find solidarity with others by hating a common enemy? Did it emerge in part from hating his own queerness, his own difference? I remember when I was just starting to get involved with the LGBT community, I quickly learned an inside joke. Whenever a politician or a church leader did or said something particularly hateful towards the LGBT community, someone would lean over and nudge me and say, you just wait, in a few years we'll see the news story, Senator caught with another man. And it wasn't just a joke. It came to some extent from the wisdom of years spent watching the patterns, watching this actually play out. You see, those in the LGBT community had figured out the same thing that former skid head Christian Piccolini had. That usually, the strongest, most violent hatred comes from people who are projecting their own self-hatred. People who are trying to stuff away some part of themselves that they don't like. The toxicity within themselves spills over and the violence that they're doing to themselves internally, they start to do externally. They start extinguishing not just the queerness in themselves, but the queerness and the difference they see in anyone. Picciolini stops at one point in his talk 
and he acknowledges that he had bought into their white supremacist doctrine that immigrants were to blame for all the country's ills, that they were stealing good people's jobs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He says he bought into it even though his own parents were first-generation immigrants, and he had watched their struggle, and he knew they were good people. So what is it that sparks conversion? What sparks transformation? What gets someone to do that complete 180 from hate speech and violence toward a path of love? Well, for both Christian Piccolini and Megan Phelps Roper, like Paul, they had an epiphany and they realized that they had been wrong, but there was a lot more to it than that. You know, when the things that you have been a part of, things that formerly gave you a sense of identity and purpose and that belonging, when those things start to unravel, it can leave you feeling pretty lost and disoriented. For Paul, it literally left him blind. A 180 in life means that you have completely turned around, that you have started heading in the other direction. And when you do that, you can start asking yourself, you know, who am I now without that identity that I used to have? Where do I belong now without that group that I used to be part of? What is my purpose now without that purpose I once had? And that lostness that we feel when we're in those unraveled places, I think that's why few of us choose to walk through that kind of unraveling. And it's why, even after epiphanies, Sometimes major, major life changes don't stick. People revert back to their old ways. Paul realized he was wrong, that he had been so terribly wrong that day on that road to Damascus when that bright, blinding encounter with Jesus, that sparkling epiphany about Jesus had happened to him. But I wonder, would that encounter have been enough for him to completely change, change the way he was living, the crusade he was leading. In his blindness and in his hunger for belonging, could he not have stumbled right back into his old ways? Could the Jesus followers not have rejected him? Or not have rejected him? Could they not have said, no, redemption's not po possible for you, sorry, Certainly they had every reason in the world not to trust him, to condemn him. He had literally been killing them. What made the conversion for Paul stick? Well, I hazard to guess that it was the same thing that made the conversions for Piccolini and Phelps Roper stick. Now, it took different forms in each of their lives, but both of them experienced radical, extravagant love and grace. When they were leaving behind their former lives of violence and hate and harm, lives that they had once believed were completely righteous causes, it was the people on the other side, the people who caught them, who made all the difference. Now, Megan Phelps Roper literally became homeless when her church and family disowned her for no longer towing the line. And she and her sister at that point were taken in by some of the very people they had picketed, including a rabbi and his family. She recounts how she had once stood outside the doors of his synagogue with a sign that said, your rabbi is a whore. But in his home, after her about face, she was shown nothing but love and compassion, hospitality and forgiveness. Likewise, Christian Piccolini describes trying to rebuild his life after leaving the white power neo-Nazi movement. And he tells incredible stories as well of those he had harmed, showing him complete undeserved grace and compassion. That grace is what made all the difference for him. Paul had this dramatic epiphany that day on the road to Damascus in this encounter with Jesus that spun his life around in a complete 180. But that encounter, it still leaves him blind and directionless. 
That is, until Ananias, one of Jesus' followers, whom Paul had persecuted, until he decides to do a brave thing, a compassionate thing. He decides to show up for Saul, even though Saul had murdered his friends, even though Saul may very well arrest him. In my mind, Saul is not the hero of his own conversion story. Ananias is. This guy who took the risk of loving him because he knew the love of Christ and he knew the call that God was placing on him. When love meets you in those unraveled, lost places, when grace meets you there, it makes all the difference. Yes, we have to realize the error of our ways and want to change and want to let those old ways unravel. But we also need people who are going to love us through that unraveling. People who are willing to see us into that new way. At the very end of his TED talk, Piccolini says, of all the people I've worked with, they will tell you the same thing. One, they became extremists because they wanted to belong, not because of ideology or dogma. And second, what brought them out was receiving compassion from people they least deserved it from when they least deserved it. He concludes with this. I would like to leave you with a challenge. Go out today, tomorrow, hopefully every day. Find somebody that you think is undeserving of your compassion and give it to them. Because I guarantee you, they're the ones who need it most. Friends, think about the change you want to see in the world. Are you willing to love people into that change? Saul wouldn't have become Paul without there being someone who was willing to let him change, willing to see him change, validate that change, and love him through that unraveling as he moved into something new. What would happen if we started putting belonging ahead of belief? If we treated friends, neighbors, strangers like they belonged, like they had a place, a purpose, an identity with us, before and not after, they aligned perfectly with what we believe. What would happen if we showed each other, yes, even King Charles, grace, and let each other start afresh? What would the world look like if we allowed ourselves to, try to unravel and ravel as each of us felt called by God, without forever judging one another by our prior mistakes? I've asked you this morning to consider what we need to ask God to unravel in the world. And as I said, I invite you to think big globally about what needs to unravel. And when you have those words in mind, you can come write it up here on the table or you can put it in the chat box if you're on Zoom. You know, all those words that we're going to write in just a few moments... All of those prayers are going to be too big for us to unravel on our own. We need God's help with that unraveling. But I think we can commit to something. I think we can commit that whenever God starts to unravel something, we can be that presence of love and grace that helps that about-face path to stick. And you know, who knows? Maybe we ourselves will find ourselves spun around by God, Maybe we'll find ourselves unraveled and sent down a new path. And we, too, will need to be loved into something new. When you have your words, go ahead and come write them up here.